First thing I want to do is point you to the very bottom there of the slide where it says Linda Loveland Reed 100 at um, Linda L. Reed uh, at Gmail. And that's my email address. And what I'm doing is inviting you to send me a question from today that maybe you don't get answered or you can send me some of your artwork. I would love to see it and I will send you some of mine. The paintings behind me are mine. I, um, I started doing more figurative and now I've leaped into abstract and I'm having a lot of fun. So I would love to hear from you. Okay, let's get into Jackson Pollock. Well, Jackson and Pollock meets his wife, Lee Krasner, uh, back in 1936. He's drunk, he cuts in on her dancing, he steps on her feet, he says something vulgar and she slaps his face. And then they don't meet again for four years, but when they do, it will be for the rest of their lives together, well, his life. So who is this Jackson Pollock? We know him, we think we know him so well. He was born in 1912. And the work that he does is called Abstract Expressionism. And this is the New York School. It's post-World War II. It takes place in, in, in the New York School, of course, it's in New York. And there's a, a group of artists who are trying to do something different. And um, Jackson Pollock is, is extremely, extremely shy man. And he is very insecure. He is, unfortunately, hopeless alcoholic. And he says of himself, I am nature. He also says of himself, I have demons. And he struggles. He struggles all of his life to stop drinking. And he is, of course, a brilliant painter. Lee Krasner was born in 1908. She was actually born Lena Krasner with two S's but she changed her name. And they believe that maybe having the sort of ambiguous first name Lee wasn't a bad idea during that period of time. People might see her paintings and think she was a male. Um, she, well, her family are Russian Jews. They lived in the Ukraine and they came to the United States escaping a pogrom. She uh, was born in the United States. She was the last child of their, of, I think there might've been like five. And um, she studied law in school. She refused to sing carols and she was, uh, you know, kind of a rebel, but she also studied history and Nietzsche and so on. And the whole idea of, you know, God is dead and uh, one sets their own moral standard, and in the end, she will leave religion behind. I have a secret. My secret is that I like Lee Krasner's work, um, maybe just a tad more than I like Pollock. And I like Pollock for a lot of reason. But I you, look at this. This is a Lee Krasner. We're going to get to this a little later on. How do you not love that? So please do send me um, an email or give me a question. I'd love to hear what you think of that. So Lee Krasner was very excited. She was an accomplished artist. She had taken lots and lots of art classes before she ever met Pollock. She was very well known in the art community and highly respected. So she gets invited to a modernist show. She's very excited about it. She goes down the whole list of everyone. But she sees a name she doesn't know. And she says, who the hell is Jackson Pollock? So she finds out that he lives just down the street from her. So she goes down there. She climbs the five stories to his apartment, knocks on the door. And he very traditionally, Pollock opens it very slowly, barely says anything probably hello. She says, we're in the same art show together and I just thought it'd be great that we would meet. I'd love to see your work. So he invites her in. She sees his work. And at that moment, she said she knew that he was going to be a great painter. And she really dedicated herself to that. So she, she said, um, that he, he, she said, why don't you come visit me? And uh, so three months later, he 
goes down and he goes to her apartment. He likes her work. He always liked her work. And she said to him, would you like a cup of coffee? And he said, sure. And she gets her coat and hat because Lee Krasner had never turned on her stove. She will eventually become known as an excellent cook. So what we have is a man that is very attractive to her. He was like Marlon Brando, and she knew he was going to be America's next great artist. For him, Pollock was just struck by Lee Krasner. She was, she was in control. She was confident. She could talk with people. He couldn't do that. Um, you know, and, and, she, and he loved her work, and she was very well connected and, and a trained artist. So she was in love, and he needed her. And actually, Lee Krasner came into Jackson Pollock's life just in time because he was really going down. He was having binges. When he was drinking, he was a very, very unpleasant person. Lots of fighting and erratic behavior. Now, he lived in New York with his brothers, off and on with two of his brothers who were also artists. And, um, and their wives. And it, it was really difficult. Uh, one of the couples wanted to have a child and the wife said, no, I'm not bringing a child into our apartment while you have this situation because the brothers were going out nightly looking for Pollock, picking him up out of the street um, or, or wherever he was. It was very difficult. In 1932, Jackson Pollock became suicidal. And in 1938, he was admitted to Bellevue Mental Hospital. Now he was there for three months and many people believe that if he had only stayed six months or longer, that he might've changed his life. But he could be very charming when he wanted to and very convincing. And in three months, he had them convinced that he was just, you know, he was fine and ready to go, which was unfortunate. His family was concerned with him, um, wanted, you know, what was wrong with him? Why did he have all these erotic tendencies? And uh, he had never had a girlfriend when he was in high school. He didn't have women in his life. They wondered if maybe there was a sexuality issue here. Maybe he was homosexual. That's talked about off and on. No proof whatsoever. Um, and enter Lee Krasner into his life. She took over. She managed his life. She managed his art. She was the one who made the connections and set up exhibits and everything that had to be done. She really saved his life. So after they were together for three years, she gave him a, um, we're going to cut to the chase. We're either going to get married or we're separating. And Pollock wanted to get married in the church. Um, and, but it was difficult because they were, this was back in the um, 1944, 45, and they were mixed um, religion. She was Jewish and he was Christian. They had to find somebody that would marry him, but they did. They had asked Peggy Guggenheim, who had very important um, gallery and was an art collector and was um, supporting, uh, you know, giving uh, Pollock a stipend every month. Um, they asked her to stand up for them in their wedding. And what she said was, she said, aren't you married enough? So those were the days when in the artist community, getting married wasn't the high priority. Well, they did get married and they moved to a farmhouse in the Springs in Long Island. This is a, a picture of it. Um, Guggenheim gave them a loan so they could buy it. I think it was maybe as much as 5,000. It was three hours from New York. There was no toilet. There was no hot water. Of course, they fixed it all up eventually. Now, during this time, Pollock didn't drink uh, for two years, and that was wonderful. And there was a barn, and he painted in the barn, although the barn was extremely cold. But nevertheless, that's where he painted. 
and um, she painted upstairs. So they, most of his famous work was done during this period of time. And you can see the two of them here out in the barn with all of these fabulous works all around them. So exciting. I mean, isn't that work just exciting? So this is uh, Pollock's family. And right here, we have the mom, Stella, and we have the father. And there are five boys, if you can imagine. Charles, Sandy, Jay, Frank, and Jackson. And Jackson is the youngest, and he was mom's favorite. So Frank is the father. He began as a farmer. Uh, there was a lot of moving around with the family. Maybe five, six times they moved. Um, and each time it was not for the best because it was difficult times and they weren't doing well. He became a surveyor and he sort of separates himself from the family. And, um, but, he, but he always stays in touch with the children and so on. Now, Stella, she's controlling the family. She's a strong personality and she did not ever discipline her children, her boys. She was the one who, uh, of course they went to school, but when it came to any other social gatherings like Sunday school or any of that, no way, she kept those kids with her and she brought those kids up. Um, and Jackson was a favorite, but the relationship there was very complex. Um, it, was, it was kind of like almost a love-hate relationship. He, he loved his mother, she was his, he, he was her favorite, but, but um, uh, she was also a very, very strong personality. So the father writes a letter to Pollock when Pollock is already having some problems. And he says, the secret of success is concentrated interest in life, to be fully awake to everything. The more you learn, the more you can appreciate life. It sounds like to me that he's a very thoughtful man. This is Jackson Pollock when he was in Manual High School in Los Angeles. What a hunk. So his brothers, Charles and Sandy, uh, were artists and they had gone to New York. And um, Pollock also wanted to be an artist, but he had trouble drawing. Um, he really just couldn't do what the others could do in his art class. He just struggled so, and I think that struggle and what was going on inside of him is eventually found its way out. And when it did, he did something completely different and astounding. It was in high school that he was introduced to theosophy. Now we know Madame Blavatsky and she's a Russian and she started theosophy and it is very complex. Um, it, it has to do with reincarnation and stages that you go through in life and color. And many artists are, were attracted to theosophy, including Kandensky and many others. And right down to today, uh, there are many people in the cultural arts of all types that are involved with theosophy. So Jackson Pollock got into that. He was expelled from high school. Um, he never had any girlfriends. Um, and he, unfortunately, about age 15 or 16, he learned to drink. He, he went on a job uh, with his dad in Arizona and um, in the summer, and the guys would give him beer. And then he would just careen around. And everybody thought it was funny. Um, the thing of it was, is it took very little for Jackson Pollock to be drunk. And that was the beginning for him. So it turned out to not be too funny after all. So he decides to go to New York and try to become an artist where his brothers are. When he gets there, he uh, enters into um, uh, an art a class with Thomas Hart Benton. Now, Thomas Hart Benton is a very famous leader of what we would call regionalism. And this is social realism, but, but region, regionalism is the term that, that uh, we would use mostly for him. And you can see that his paintings are about American life. He did these huge murals. And if you've ever seen his work, this is the Missouri mural 
uh, you will be astounded by it. Uh, it's, it's really wonderful. He went to Paris, uh, Benton did, and he studied there. He knew all of the um, uh, modernists, uh, but what he said when he came back is he really hated that kind of work. He said, it took me years to get the abstract modernist mud off of my feet. And so this is the kind of work that he turned to. And you might be surprised with this because it's quite different than what Jackson Pollock did. Very different. In fact, here's one of Jackson Pollock's er earlier works. Now, you've probably, you're all artists and you've probably all seen some of Jackson Pollock's pre-drip work. I think it's just fabulous. I mean, this is just such an exciting piece. And, um, he, what Jackson Pollock said is that Thomas Hart Benton drove his kind of realize, realism at me so hard, I bounced right into non-objective painting. And this is just a fabulous painting. So we've got surrealism here. During, you know, during the both wars, we had thousands of artists coming over from Europe. And what they did is they brought in concepts that had been developed over there already such as surrealism. And surrealism, we think of that as sort of a dream state. Um, and also automatism, which of course you all know, it's when you subconsciously let your feelings come right through your hands and, and out onto the canvas. And that's what we see here. So this is a wonderful piece. And um, the other thing is, it's breaking away from Picasso. What I mean by that is that artists all over the world were having a, 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 a difficult time because Picasso's um, dynamism coming in with Cubism and Cubism just took over everywhere. Um, and all of the artists from Europe and all of that long history and what, it, what the Americans were trying to do is paint their own way, have their own originality. And so there is this, there is this theme to get away from uh, that kind of art and do something original. And there, uh, Jackson Pollock used, um, I'm sorry, Nina, to get, to get a sip of water. Jackson Pollock used a lot of mythology and um, you can see here that we have kind of hieroglyphics in here. Uh, he loved Indian sand painting, which is interesting because it was on the ground. So later when he makes his big breakthrough, he's painting on the ground and, um, and, the, and those colors. And of course we can see these hieroglyphics in here. It's, it's really a beautiful work. I just wanna say before we leave this, this is a woman and this is her face and this long, Black is her body and then her arms and so on. And um, I would like to know uh, your concept or, or your thoughts for this. I just see so much energy in here that I, I just feel that the energy it was painted with originally can pop right out even on a Zoom screen. This is another one that he did in 1943 called Guardian of the Secrets. It's a very famous piece and what we have are here are the guardians on each side, <clears throat> lots of hieroglyphics and so on. And I don't know if this is a confiscus or whatever it is, there's something down here. I think it's a type of animal maybe. Um, so uh, very, very exciting piece. Um, this was the most startling piece in a show in 1943, really got people talking. And there's influences here from African, Native American, and prehistoric art. All of these were, and, and of course, mythology. That was all acceptable. You could go there for ideas. You just didn't want to go to the Europe artist for ideas. And he was in Jungian analysis, and he actually took his psychologist with him to art shows and, you know, while it didn't stop him from drinking, it did have an effect on his art. Um, and automatism, as we talked about, what Jackson Pollock believed is that automatism gave work authenticity. And I don't know, I just, I'm, I just feel so, um, so true 
about this piece when I look at it. So, um, so authentic, whatever that might mean. This is another one of his called the Chi Wolf. This was a really important painting because it was the first painting that got into a major museum. MoMA purchased this for $650. And um, he said of this piece, she just had to be painted. It really is an exciting piece. So what we have here is the wolf advances leftward and we have a thick, unreadable calligraphy and all kinds of things going on. So this is what came out of Jackson Pollock. You know, maybe he couldn't draw a perfect face, but he could certainly do this. Now, I said that Lee Krasner was painting upstairs, and she was. Uh, of course, her format is going to be smaller because she didn't have a barn. Um, these um, are called Little Image Series, and she did a lot of them. And if you, this isn't, it's hard to, it's hard to see these really well, but they're really fantastic. She did them flat, um, and, and she also applied paint with little sticks and palette knife and from the tube and and brushes and all of that. So these are really very wonderful and original. Um, so, well, of, of course, we had the wars, and uh, this is World War II uh, post, and um, uh, Pollock uh, tried to enlist, but he was 4F deferment because of his um, um, going to Bellevue and some of his issues. Um, and of course, they were dealing with the whole, the whole United States, the whole world was dealing with atomic bomb, the, um, the, the whole um, Holocaust situation. And um, in December of 42, uh, 500,000 New York Jews went silent to honor those killed in the camps. And what Krasner said of this period for her, she calls it her mud period. She said, I just couldn't get any color. I couldn't get anything out on my canvas that wasn't just mud. So Jackson Pollock get the commission. It's 1944. Harold Putzer is the manager of Peggy Guggenheim's um, gallery. And he encourages Peggy to go see this Pollock guy. You know, I'm hearing things about him. I think he's going to be uh, something important. So why don't you go see him and give him a commission? So Peggy Guggenheim did. She set up an appointment with him. Of course, Jackson Pollock was late. Um, but this is the commission that she gives to him. She wants a very large painting, large indeed. It's eight by 20 feet. And she wants to put it in the her entrance in her New York suite. Well, it must have been a very big entrance and a very big suite. Um, so she, she hires him to do this in July and she says, okay, I'm gonna give you a show and I'm gonna give you a show in November and I'd like this ready for the show. So at the time, Lee Krasner and Pollock were living in, this is before they got married and they're living in a New York apartment. They took out a wall, uh, they had to, to um, give enough space for that canvas to go up. Well, he never painted anything. Months and months and months went by and absolutely nothing happened. And he missed the show. And so Peggy Guggenheim said to him, okay, remember, she's giving him a stipend as well, like $150 a month. And so what she said to him is, I want that painting and I want it by January 1. And if I don't get it, we're not going to have a stipend, but it was going to be worse than that. If you disappointed Peggy Guggenheim, one of the only galleries that were showing modern art, well, you might as well just hang it up. And Lee Krasner was so, so concerned. And she, she went away for a week and she thought maybe, you know, that would help. That didn't help. She comes back, nothing. Uh, Pollock says, just, just lock me in the bedroom and, you know, give me, just give me some food. Other than that, you know, and no, nothing happened. So the night before it was due, uh, Lee Krasner went to bed thinking, okay, this is it. It's over. It's over. And in the morning, this is what she woke up to. It's fabulous. I mean, I just don't know how he could do such a thing. I mean, the rhythm, the rhythm and, and, and the repeats that go through. And it's, it's just exciting. And the colors and, and it, what Jackson Pollock said, 
It's, it's a stampede of Mustangs, cows, antelopes, bulls, you name it. Everything is charging across that goddamn surface. And it is indeed. I'd love to know what you think about it. Have you seen it? I, I saw it at the Getty. And um, I tell you, it is an amazing piece. This is Peggy Guggenheim, and she's at the Arc of this Century. And that's the name of her very important gallery. And you can see that she's sitting in one of her chairs that she had designed. You'll notice there's a curve to the side of the walls. Nobody had seen anything like this. She used to hang the uh, painting so that they literally could be turned and in, in different directions. So this, this was something that was extraordinary and it was very important. I have a lecture on her and I'm giving it by the way at Sebastopol Center for the Arts on March 10th. So, um, so Peggy, what Lee Krasner said is that Peggy really started the whole thing. Well, that was a lot coming from Lee Krasner because Lee and Peggy, two very strong women, did not get along that well. Um, Peggy had a London gallery and after the, and of course with the war, she closed that down and she came back to the United States. She had an association with the Surrealists from Europe and she continued to show their work, but eventually starting with Pollock, she got so that she was really supporting the American artist of modernists. And, um, and as I said, she was, she was paying Pollock. She eventually was giving him $300 stipend, but this meant she owned his work. So whatever he painted, she owned, but when she sold it, she would give him a commission. And in the, in the end, there was a bit of an argument over some of the pieces that she um, owned, but that was the deal. This is Jackson Pollock's painting called Lucifer. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's, it's really fantastic. It's uh, nine feet um, and it's at the Anderson yeah, uh, collection. I gave you a lecture on the Anderson collection and I've taken tours down there, but if you go down to Stanford, you will see this piece and I highly recommend that you go see that collection. So this is a big moment in art. I mean, art historians just love markers and this is a huge marker. So what is so big about it? Well, Jackson Pollock did some extraordinary things. He got rid of the easel. He painted on the floor. Um, that, that was huge. And, you know, maybe some of his idea, I mean, we had murals. So we'd seen, we'd seen large things, but they were murals. This is a painting. And he took it off the easel and put it down on the floor. Uh, he had got rid of the brush. And so he's dripping out of the bottom of a can or he's using a turkey baster or he's using a stick. And um, so this was this was very important moment. What do the critics say? Well, the, some of them said it's undisciplined American fury. Some said it's monotonous intensity. And some said it's free, freedom from Paris. And of course, what we mean by that is getting the, the whole um, Picasso thing uh, off your back and doing something that is truly American and truly original. You might remember this, Life Magazine, 1949. And the question was asked, is, is this America's greatest painter? And here we have him. It's a little hard to see, you know, but you can tell he's, very casual. He's got a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. And so Jackson Pollock really started the artist personality, that bad boy, you know, the struggle, the brooding artist and all of that. And Fortune Magazine picked up on it and put an article in and they said also that art is a good investment. So, th so this whole thing from abstract expressionist upward is going to be the beginning of these humongous amounts of money that get paid for art today, such as 450 million for the Leonardo. I know you all know about that. There's a reason for this. Um, and um, I have a, a class, uh, um, a lecture about uh, the high art end of the world. And it's, it, there, there are reasons for it, but I know it seems completely outrageous. Um, so Jackson Pollock uh, is getting some fame, but uh, it's difficult because he's also 
highly criticized. I mean, people are saying, this is fraudulent. I mean, my kid could do that. Th this is ridiculous. This isn't art. And, you know, um, and so, and he's a very, a very, very insecure man. And he's really struggling with it. So he paints this painting called Lavender Mist. Um, it's very hard to see Jackson Pollock's work uh, on this kind of a venue or unless you're seen, standing in front of it. And I, I, I hope you get to do that. And I know you have already and just stand there and really spend some time. I, I know when I was in Peggy Guggenheim's uh, gallery in Venice, uh, I was just struck, struck. And I just, just stood there and just, I, I was, it was the first time I, I really understood Jackson Pollock. So what he does is he paints this painting and he goes in the house and he gets Lee Krasner and he says to her, come out to the barn, I want you to look at this. And he says to her, is this a painting? So, you know, he, he was struggling with that. This is the inside of their house. They had a wonderful time. Uh, they broke down some walls and, you know, they, they eventually, of course, they, they put in a, a bathroom and the, all the hot and hot water and all that kind of stuff that they didn't have, but they had a wonderful time. They cooked, they canned, they gardened, Pollock did baking. Um, they, they, they had a good time. They rode their bikes. They did not have a car. A lot of New Yorkers, you know, never knew how to drive, didn't have a car. Um, so they, you know, they went clamming and um, they, they, they had a good life for a couple of years. So this is a family reunion. This is Pollock's family. And here, it, right here, we have Lee. And here we have Jackson Pollock. And then the rest of the family. And they're all around mom. Here's mom, Stella. Uh, and the brothers and the sisters. Uh, they had a kind of a reunion. And you can see that they're all, their pictures taken here in front of Jackson Pollock, who was sort of gloating. Um, but there was tension and the tension was that, you know, for years, the brothers had taken care of Pollock. Uh, Jackson hadn't done anything to help with mom. And now that he was, you know, doing better and had, had you, you know, a, a few dollars, uh, it seemed that maybe he was bragging. And so um, there, there was a, a little bit of tension. So this is um, November, 1950. And it was Thanksgiving, uh, and uh, a couple of months before that, um, Hans Namath had gotten a hold of Pollock, and he was a photographer. And you might remember this. Um, he wanted to take pictures of Jackson painting, and he devised this um, glass where Jackson would paint on the glass, and he would shoot from underneath. And it was in all the magazines, and, and it was quite popular. Um, so the last day when they finished after a couple of months of hard work, um, it was Thanksgiving and uh, Lee Krasner had fixed one of her famous meals and, you know, the turkey, the gravy, the wine, the table was set beautifully, you know, the dressing, the friends and all of that. And Jackson and Hans Namath came in and Jackson said, well, I think we'll celebrate. I think I'll have a drink. And he went under the cupboard and he pulled out a bottle and everybody was dead quiet. And Hans Namath said, I, I don't think that's probably a good idea. And with that, Jackson picked up the end of the table and said, oh, you think so? And flipped the table and everything shattered. And that was the beginning of the end. This is 1952. It's called Blue Poles. It has an interesting background. Um, it, it was a, um, he started painting it and, and um, he was in his barn. It was a horrible storm and he was very, very drunk. He called his friend, Tony Smith, who was a sculptor. And he um, said that he was going to kill himself. And um, Tony gets in his car, he drives two hours. He gets there, it's in the middle of the night. And uh, he distracts, um, uh, Pollock says, let's paint a picture together. So they start painting on this picture. Lee was terrified of, um, of uh, uh, thunder and lightning and she was in the house. And um, so they worked on this through the night. Six months later, uh, Pollock goes out to the barn and he takes 
uh, two by four and he drenches it in this blue color and lays the tent, the, the um, pole down on the painting and you can see those, those blue poles. And, um, and, and later this gets purchased. It, um, it, oh, and I, I wanted to tell you that Port Jackson Pollock at this time, he is taking these treatments. He's drinking guano. If you know what guano is, it's, it's bird droppings. So he's drinking guano and ground beets and he's bathing in rock salt. I mean, he went through five various different treatments and people just really didn't know how to deal with alcoholism. And um, so anyway, as I said, this gets, uh, this gets uh, um, started in a storm. In 1972, Australia buys this for 2 million and it is a national scandal. People are outraged. How dare you spend our tax dollars for this awful thing? And, um, and of course now today it is one of Australia's treasures and it is no doubt worth a hundred million plus. Other artists uh, at the time, uh, of course, are working alongside um, Jackson Pollock trying to develop this American art. This is William and Elaine de Kooning. Um, and, I'm oh, sorry. And they are both artists. And uh, William de Kooning, there's, there's really two camps, okay? So there's the camp that thinks that Jackson Pollock's uh, going in the right direction. And there's the camp that is following William de Kooning. William de Kooning was much more friendlier and a lot easier to get along with. And Elaine de Kooning is also a painter and she was a writer and she was doing uh, critiques and she very highly respected in the um, uh, community at that time. Of course, originally there weren't very many painters uh, working, uh, maybe 50 um, and everybody knew her. And, and, the, and so uh, this is their work. This is Jackson Pollock's here. Of course, his very famous woman series that he did. And you'll notice that there's something in here. It's a figure. It's not supposed to be there. That's one of the things about abstract expressionism. So ab abstract expressionism is not a style because you can see this is completely different from Jackson Pollock. It's, you know, I mean, they were all doing something different. It was the concept. It was the inner idea of, uh, of abstract expressionism. And this is, this is Elaine, um, and this is a bull. It's one of my all-time favorite. I love both of these. This is one of my all-time favorite paintings. I just think that the um, excitement, there's an excitement. I love the colors. I like the, um, the um, wildness of it. Uh, to me, it just exudes energy. Um, I, I, I love it. I'd like to hear what you have to say. This is Elaine Pollock. Here she is up on a ladder and she's painting um, John uh, Kennedy. And, um, you know, she probably did a hundred paintings of JFK as he had asked her to do his portrait. She also would draw him off of the TV. And here she is uh, painting. He, uh, he really did very much like the painting that she did of him. And I can see why. Um, she, she's a marvelous painter. Okay, so this brings us to Clifford Still. Now he is another one of the abstract expressionists. Peggy Guggenheim gave him a show and this is his work. Um, he was um, uh, from North Dakota and you can kind of get this feel of landscape from his painting. Um, it's said of him, he's a 100% American painter. He was right after Pollock with that title. Um, and he was kind of a kind of a Western guy. He had a very strong, strong personality. Um, and he comes to the Bay Area and he brings this artwork and he has a show in 1947 at San Francisco MoMA. And it is a real pow. I mean, all of the artists in San Francisco are painting abstract expressionists. And Clifford Still is teaching at the California School of Fine Arts, which we know today is the San Francisco Art Institute. It was started way back in 1872. So Clifford Still basically has rules, um, you know, and you can see uh, by you can see by looking at this painting that um, there are rules. Uh, no horizon line at all. 
no foreground, no background, no border, no, no, um, absolutely no figurative, uh, no narrative. So, um, it, you know, these are the rules of abstract expressionism. And he comes, like I said, he's in San, he's in San Francisco, and everybody's painting this way. Well, David Park, who is an artist, and he's also teaching at the school, um, he gets tired of the rules. And what he does is he takes all his paintings, all his abstract paintings, and loads them into um, his truck. And he drives them to the Oakland dump, and he burns them all up. And then he paints with a figure. Do you like this painting? It's some of my all-time favorite work. Um, all of the abstract, uh, I'm sorry, the, the Bay Area figurative, which is what this is. And we should be very, very proud of this movement. Bay Area figurative, it is known internationally as well as nationally. Um, it, it, is, it is something that we, we can take pride in. Um, so what do we have here, though? Um, it, it's really not a portrait, is it? It's not, you're not looking at, at oh, that's Jane and that's her face. Um, it, it really is still abstract expressionism, but it just has figures in it. I mean, you're looking at the whole painting as an object. You're not looking at a vase or a face or a tree or a flower, which is what the artists were getting away from. They wanted you to look at the whole painting as an art piece as an object, and you still are doing that. And so it's really, Bay Area figurative is really putting the figurative into an abstract expressionist paint, painting. I just think that it's so strong and I love all his lights and the way he came in with that light and uh, it's, it's, it's fabulous. Okay, so what did the general public think? Well, the general public did not understand this kind of art at all and they weren't interested in it. In fact, uh, McCarthy, Senator and uh, Don Darrow, they started something called the Society for Sanity in Art. What they said was that it's un-American, this kind of painting. In fact, it's communistic. And those who support this kind of modern art are actually enemies and it's conspiracy by Moscow. Now, you might think that that's kind of radical but they received, uh, uh, Don Darrow received a gold medal for his service to American art. And you know who gave him the medal? It was given to him by the International Fine Arts Council. So you can see that the general population isn't buying into this, but eventually they will big time. This is Jackson Pollock's called Convergence and they made a puzzle out of this. And it's supposed to be one of the world's hardest puzzles. Duh, you think? I would think so. So it's, we're in the Cold War. A lot of folks are looking at communism. Why? Because uh, we've had two world wars and a depression. Hey, maybe capitalism isn't working very well. So what else might work? Well, if you look to what's going over with the Soviet Union, the laborers are supposedly running the country. Um, so a lot of folks are leaning into communism. It, uh, when we look at modern art and we look at somebody like Pollock, who's considered to be a rebel, the message is freedom. And as, oh, sorry. And as a matter of fact, the CIA is backing and sponsoring um, modern art exhibits. And why would they do that? Because what they wanna say is look here, we were even giving during the WPA, the government was even paying artists but we did not tell them how to paint. Our artists here in America paint whatever they want. Just look at all this modern art. So that was the, that was the message that they were trying to get out. So Jackson Pollock is ill. His alcoholism is taking its toll. He's in terrible binges. He ends up in the hospital. He ends up in jail. Uh, he, he does stupid stunts. Um, he, uh, I mean, when he's drinking, he's just completely wild. Um, uh, Lee Krasner had taken art classes from the very, very famous Hans Hoffman, and they were invited to Hans Hoffman for a party. And Jackson goes up to the second floor on a balcony, and he throws 
uh, Hans Hoffman's easel uh, down into the uh, living room below. Um, he um, urinates in Peggy Guggenheim's fireplace at a party that she gives on his behalf. So you can see, um, you know, it's becoming very, very difficult. He breaks windows um, and, and he sometimes goes to jail. Um, so the Cedar Caver Tavern is famous for a place in New York where artists would gather. And we're talking about a time when maybe there's 50 artists on the New York scene. Eventually there'll be a lot more, but um, uh, so this is, this is where the club meets and the club is very famous. Uh, once, a, once a week, um, an artist will give a lecture uh, about their point of view because theory was everything. Theory was everywhere. And so everybody was talking about art and, and how to do it and why and the right way. And, and uh, so it was a very exciting time. So Jackson would come into town to go to his um, psychiatrist. Uh, and when he did, he'd go to this tavern. Well, um, as, as time went on and Pollock uh, and these artists became more well known, the young artists who were coming into town and beginning and staying in New York wanted to actually touch a Pollock for good luck. Uh, they also wanted to buy him a drink, see what would happen and plenty happened. Uh, okay, so Lee Krasner is so worried about Pollock and his state that she calls Stella. Stella comes out to visit and Lee and um, Pollock want her to live there. Well, the brothers, the rest of the brothers said, no way. She's got arthritis, she's not well, and there is no way that she's gonna go through this. And they absolutely refuse. It probably would not have worked. So the art world is changing. And what Jackson Pollock says, and he was really a very uh, thoughtful person when you read his writings. He said, the strong, the strangeness will wear off. And I think we will discover the deeper meanings in modern art. And of course he was 100% right. So artists are starting to make money and they just don't need each other the way they used to. It's not that same struggling group. They're buying homes, they're moving to the suburbs, they're having families, and abstract expressionism does become the establishment. Um, it becomes uh, something that people do want. Um, so this is Lee Krasner. Now, Lee began, she's been painting all along, but she just hasn't been doing much with it. This is a breakthrough kind of thing for her. It's like 1955. And what she does is she takes former work and strips it all up and puts it back together and paints on it. She has a show and she does very well. The critics love her work. In fact, they say what she's doing is she's broadening out the whole idea of what you paint under abstract expressionism. I think this is just a fabulous piece. It's so strong. Those big black bold pieces with the white in there and just the right amount of other colors and the geometry of it. I just, it's so exciting. This is another of hers. Um, this is black and white collage. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm doing a little, starting a little bit of collage now and this is very inspirational to me. So Lee learns to drive a car. That's right, they, she never did before. So she's getting a little bit of independence here. Um, so Jackson Pollock basically, um, fame wasn't at all what he thought it was going to be. It involved uh, a lot of praise, but it also involved a lot of criticism that was ugly. Um, and some people uh, were just, plain envious, some artists were, um, and he saw it that way and it ate at him. He said, I'm the greatest. Um, and so he tried to boost his own ego. Um, he traded one of his paintings for a 1950 Olds convertible. This is not gonna turn out to be good. This is a painting that he did in 1953. So he believed that the um, angst that was inside of him uh, was um, actually somehow communicable and beautiful. 
that he could make it into something. These paintings that he did are brutally um, almost violent things. Um, if this is automatism and this is what is inside his head, you, you really have to have some sympathy. Uh, very strong, uh, but still difficult. This is a Pollock. And, um, you know, it's beautiful. And it might remind you of Matisse because Lee Krasner said uh, the one thing she did maybe bring to Pollock was she introducing him to Matisse. It's a gorgeous painting. Well, what do you do after you drip? Um, he had done many, many, many drip paintings and he wanted to move away from that and he wanted to start doing something else. But, you know, once you become famous for something that's, you know, but he he was branching out. And I think that's just absolutely extraordinary painting. Um, and he had a show, he had a show and the reviews were good. People said, hey, this guy can actually paint. Well, what do you do when you, when somebody says that? Do you say, oh, thank you. Because if you do, then you're denying the work that came before. Was the work before not good, wasn't painting. So again, even though things were good, it was still a dilemma. This is another one of his paintings. I think it's extraordinary. It's just so, so expressive. Um, do you like this? Clement Greenberg, who was one of the theorists, the um, critics that were developing all this theory during the time, he said of the show that Pollock had is that Pollock had a 10 year run, but now it's over. Well, Clement Greenberg, I totally disagree. I think that if Jackson had lived that we would have had some wonderful art. Well, things are not going well. Jackson Pollock has an affair with Ruth Klugman and Klugman and she, she writes a book and that's a painting that he did for her and gave to her that she puts on the front of his uh, front of the book. Um, and it is debatable uh, and talked about uh, whether this was the last painting that he ever did. Um, so Lee Krasner um, is diagnosed with colitis, which is a very, very serious um, um, intestinal uh, issue. Um, and she is very, very exhausted. The, the fighting uh, is uh, nonstop and she is becoming more and more the parent every day to his child. And this does not bode well for a marriage. Um, Pollock feels, you know, abandoned uh, by her attitude. Um, and what Lee does is she takes a vacation. She goes to France. Um, and while she is there, she gets a phone call. And the phone call tells her that Pollock was in a crash in the springs in his convertible and that he died. And so he's age 44. He dies in August of 1956. What a terrible loss. Um, so Lee Krasner. Um, is dealing with the estate. Um, she's dealing with insomnia um, and she gets up and she goes to the barn and she paints at night. And she said, I just couldn't bring any color in. I just couldn't have any color. And she painted and she begins to paint these huge paintings. Um, here we have a picture of her painting and um you know it was I'm sorry it was it was really believed that only a man could attack such a huge canvas that would have the energy and spirit if you will to paint so large and of course Lee Krasner is just out there doing a bang up job of it. Um, she is emerging from being Mrs. Po uh, Mrs. Um, um, Jackson Pollock to being Lee Krasner. 
she was known as Mrs. Pollock. I mean, yeah, I mean, and uh, on, and now here she is. It's all coming out. She's just painting these wonderful things. She does think something called the Earth Green series. She does 17 and they're wonderful fabulous colors. This one certainly is not the color of a widow. Uh, she's flourishing. She she is emerging. This is called the season. Does it in 1957? So that's the year after Pollock dies. And um, and she said she painted a lot with tears running down her face. So she is in mourning, and um, but she is is really um, really coming coming to her own person. Um, if you look at this painting, it has all kinds of things going on in it. Um, you can see fruits and different things. It has sort of a, a, a sexual a feeling to it as well. Of course, the color kind of helps that. Uh, maybe there's birth in here. Um, it, it's a very, very interesting uh, painting to study. So Lee Krasner is asked often, were you influenced by Pollock? And she said, of course, everybody was influenced by Pollock. She said, he would, uh, he would even have influenced me if I hadn't been married to him. I think, however, she said, that I've held my own identity right through. And she really did. Here she is in her studio. Um, she says of her relationship with Jackson Pollock, sure, it was tough, big deal. I was in love with Pollock and he was in love with me. And she can take credit for Pollock. That's for sure. So Krasner had her own career and she did it her way. So Lee Krasner, um, you know, she had colitis um, and years later in 1984, she dies of diverticulitis uh, at the age of 76. And um, she says again of their relationship with Jackson, there was quiet solitude, just to sit and look at the landscape and inner quietness, no need for talking. They had 15 years together. So the legacy of Lee Krasner is that six months after her death, MoMA held a retrospective and defined Lee Krasner's place as a major abstract expressionist artist. She is in the canon. She starts a Pollock Krasner Foundation to help other artists and we have to thank Lee for Pollock. Uh, and of course, she is a brilliant artist on her own. The legacy of Jackson Pollock is that he really is the best known American artist. And if people know his name even who don't know anything about art. He rejected the canvas and the brush, so he did something very different. His image as, an, as a, a brooding, struggling artist became mythical. Um, and his art represented freedom. And he is the most American of abstract expression artists. And in 2006, $140 million was paid for one of his paintings, which at that time was the highest price that was ever paid. So as a man, Jackson Pollock was vulnerable, terribly vulnerable. As an artist, he was brilliant. And so I thank you very much. And uh, I do want to let you know that I have some coming lectures. Uh, August, I mean, January 13th, this is for Sebastopol Center for the Arts. I'm doing Gauguin. February 10th, Jacob Lawrence. And March 10th is Peggy Guggenheim. And uh, they're free, or you can give a donation beginning as little as $5. So thank you all so much. I'm going to stop talking now and I'm going to stop screen sharing and we can have some questions. Thank you so much. This was great. Thank it was you. Wonderful. It was it was so great to see and and it was it worked out perfectly. So I'm very happy. Good. <laughs> Well, Did you feel that Lee, 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 Lee Krasner was always in his shadow? Yes, well, and purposefully she did this. Um, she was right out front, but it was all about Pollock. She continued painting 
Uh, eventually, she she did have a show. But you know, let's face it, Jackson Pollock was not the kind of personality that could have that competition from her. It wasn't going to be that that stage was not going to work to be shared. And she knew that. And plus, she really believed in his artwork. And she wanted to do everything she could to promote him. And she did. She did. If it hadn't have been for her, we just who knows what would have happened. So are there any questions? You're all muted. You can unmute yourselves, I think. Oh, I just want to say that was great. I learned so much. I didn't know that. I had, first of all, I hadn't seen that many pre-drip um, Pollock paintings before. And also, I love the way you expanded so much on Lee Krasner, who I also didn't know that much. I sort of always knew that she had sort of, you know, mm -hmm. was in, it was in Pollock's shadow. But um, she, and I have, I have, you know, that beautiful one that you showed at the beginning. I, that's at the, um, the Whitney in New York, I think. And um, yeah. anyway, I just love them both more now. Thank you. Yeah, it is nice to get in touch with her because she's a very important artist. I didn't realize she had such fame at the time. I thought it was, you know, kind of afterwards people were, well, her personal fame when the general population did not come until after Pollock, uh, but she was very important to the art community that was in New York. The artists all knew her. She was uh, working at the artist union um, and, and she was a real advocate for artists. So within the artist community, she was a big deal. Yeah, for me, it was really fascinating to link the history that you presented with the artist and his work and the interplay of understanding him and his struggles and his family and, you know, with the art and his alcoholism. Wow, uh, it, it really makes it richer, you know? So thank you for that. I wanted to get your email address again. Will you be showing that at the end or? Um, no, but I'll give it to you. It's Linda L. Yeah. Linda L. Reed, R E I D. Yeah. At, um, I'm sorry, 100 at gmail.com. Perfect. Thank you. Great. I hope, I, I hope you send me some of your work. I'd love that. I will. I will. Yeah. Yeah. So, how did you like some of those paintings? I could make a comment there, uh, Linda, um, as a, a person who... Uh, Could you talk a little bit louder, Phil? Yes, I'm, uh, my mic uh -oh. has kind of just the, the volume on. But now you're mute. Hear me? We're, lo we're losing you for some reason. Oh. Yeah. Okay, well, I, I, I will... Yeah, we can't hear you, Phil. Too hard. No. Sorry. <laughs> Probably have a probably have a, a bad connection or something. So, um, anybody have any uh, comments about the relationship between Lee Krasner and Jackson Pollock? She stuck with him. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, you can say that again. I tell you, it was a tough one, but she loved him. She loved him. And she felt that she understood him, but uh, yeah, it it was a tough one. You know, he was he was a really um, uh, around the subject of art. He was very bright. Uh, he was well read. Um, he um, could be very very charming. It it was just the drinking just destroyed him. I thought that was interesting too about um, Krasner. Uh, painting Kennedy's portrait was he is is the final portrait in the National Portrait Gallery? I mean, I think it is. I think it is. Yeah, and uh, um, uh, Kennedy uh, really liked her work. I, I love her work, and um, and so he commissioned her, and um, she's quite famous for doing that. Yeah. What happened to the two brothers that were artists? You know, they really didn't. Uh, make it as professional artists um, it and 
it just didn't happen. And that was a lot of tension too. And the families, you could imagine here they are, you know, taking care of mom and struggling and all that. And here comes Jackson, you know, um, you know, just galloping along. And um, so it, it was a bit of a problem. Is Jackson Pollock important and popular in Europe? Yes. Yes, he's very well known and he's and he's popular. Uh, you know, the thing of like any famous artist, what happens is that the, the, the work that they're famous for is all we see. And uh, really, I, I think that some of the things that he did pre-drip are astoundingly skillful and exciting. And I mean, to me, they, some of them just take my breath away and uh, they're inventive. I mean, it, 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 they're, they're, they're really um, staggering and you just don't see them. You know, you just see the drip, you, you know, and, and the drip is fascinating and they're wonderful. Uh, but in, it, it, I always admire artists like, um, Picasso, who just kept changing his style. I mean, you know, and you have to, you have to admire a Pollock for doing the same thing. You know, um, people are starting to know them for something. And the next thing you know, they're going like, you know, look at Jasper Johns. You know, he was, he, he just, you know, right out of the bandbox, he had his flags and boy, he was just selling out and he, he was wildly famous right away. And the next thing he does is, bam, he just goes to something completely different. So very, 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 very brave. <laughs> but I think we all know as artists, I know with me, um, after painting the same way for such a long time, I did watercolors for eight years. And then I did the kind of paintings you see here, uh, the other side here, um, for about eight or nine, 10 years. And uh, when I went picked up my brush again after I hadn't painted for about three or four years and I went to paint I painted it and my husband said I really like that and my feeling was so what and I thought oh uh oh you know I need a challenge it's time for me to do something different and uh, so I leaped finally into abstract art which I always admired and didn't think I could do and and so it's been very very exciting Well, one, one good thing about Jackson Pollock, his demise is that his wife got to move into the big barn and so yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> she did. And she really, really came into her own. I mean, she was always a wonderful artist, but she really hit it big. Were there ever videos done um, that showed his work, especially with the pouring. It would be fascinating to see the process of how he goes about it and to demystify in a way the idea that it's, um, you know, that he's not a worthy artist, that it's just some, you know, I mean, the whole, even the term pouring feels like mm -hmm. one doesn't have control yeah. or one doesn't have a direction or a, yeah, you know. So, were there ever anything? I know the, there were still photographs. I saw that piece, but was well, I think you can. I think you can go online, and they might have uh, the uh, Hans Namath uh, video because he f actually filmed him and wasn't just oh, still, did. yeah, take uh, doing that. And um, I don't know about actually painting in the barn, but of course we've all seen the pictures of him uh, leaning over his, you know, his, he, he walked all the way around. He painted from all angles. And um, so we know, we know that, uh, but uh, I think you might be able to, to get something. Good, thanks. Anybody else? Well, it seems like everybody's asked their, all their questions and I really thank you all. It's been fun. Thank you. Have a wonderful rest thank of the day. You. And I hope, and Linda.